Good afternoon. It's Monday, the 23rd of January 2017. It's just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Garris, with me in the studio, of course, Mike Robinson. Had that one a bit fine. We did. Mm. And uh, we're delighted to say we are going to be joined by live video Skype link uh, by Mark Anderson from American Free Press. Uh, yes, we just made it. <laughs> um, right, well, here we go. Uh, many people over the weekend were, I think, fascinated, intrigued and astonished at uh, the women's marches. Uh, I'd just like to introduce it in this way, because, of course, Theresa May was bigging herself up uh, that she was going to uh, tackle Trump over his abuse of women. And here's the male headline on the left as two million march in protest. And I had to tweet out uh, on Saturday, I think it was, that uh, the hypocrisy is just unbelievable here because, of course, Theresa May, as Home Secretary responsible for the imprisonment of uh, child abuse whistleblower Melanie Shaw, uh, Melanie, 10 months in solitary. And who's responsible? Well, it had to be Theresa May because she was Home Secretary the whole time that that case was cooked up. So this is pretty vile stuff. Uh, but we've had a huge number of women turning out on the streets wearing um, knitted bonnets, I, I, I think, in order to show their, their um, angst at uh, Donald Trump. Um, how did these thousands of women, who coordinated them? How did they get them onto the streets? Where did the hats come from? Somebody big had to be helping this along. I think we should bring in uh, Mark at this point. Mark. What is it with these women and the hats? Because it's not just UK, is it? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, this really is centered in the US. I was told by one of the feminist agitators at a hotel where I stayed in the lobby that they planned on having, get this, protesters against the inauguration of Trump on all seven continents. And she said, including, here we go, Antarctica. I'm going to let that word float there for a minute. Uh, well, that, that's interesting because uh, last I heard they had abandoned uh, Antarctica because apparently the ice was all melting and it was going to break off into, uh, into uh, icebergs and they were all going to die if they didn't leave. So that... I pointed out the rather inconvenient fact that there's little more there than scientific outposts and anyone would be frozen in place if they tried to protest. Someone would be found... 50 years from now under 10 feet of ice with a sign in their hand. Uh, but, you know, facts are a little bit difficult for these people to deal with, uh, given that their leaders are uh, flush with money, including Soros money, George Soros. And they're wearing pink hats, I'm sure something very similar in the UK, uh, in DC. They're saying two, 300,000 turned out. They started by Independence Avenue by the Capitol building and headed west toward the White House. The whole idea is that Trump, according to the media establishment, is ushering in a new fascism. And according to the feminist establishment, is this terrible, bigoted misogynist uh, where the, the, the very idea of women uh, conjures up in him both some illicit sexual desire and some sort of total sense of disregard for, for the fairer sex. And it's all just a bunch of bluster and nonsense because... The, the, ba the bottom line is, is they just don't want to accept the reality of Trump's election and inauguration having taken the oath. And they're just flailing their arms in the wind. They're, they're just handmaidens for those that have plenty of money to burn like Mr. Soros. And they give the media the fodder that the media needs to write uh, largely just a bunch of pap and, and pablum that is just meant to malign and defame the Trump administration. Not saying the Trump administration is, is perfect. I'm not saying they don't have things to answer to, they do. But the whole thing is calculated to, to create a social and informational chaos that really has no meaning to it. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with that, uh, Mark. I found it interesting. There's quite a lot of um, uh, sites, video clips uh, saying that uh, uh, George Soros needs to be wheedled out of his uh, uh, hiding place, I think, and brought to trial for orchestrating much of this. Of course, there is a lot of evidence to show his hand in things, um, but people need to work on evidence. If Soros is behind these demonstrations, then the evidence is needed if, if that's going to be used. Mm. Now, just jump back to um, 
uh, uh, the issue of uh, what's been happening in courts. Um, this was sent through by um, Alex Thompson. Um, he's picking up on Judge Mumby, president of the uh, family courts, saying that he's rightly fuming, but sadly doesn't see how video link is incompatible with fair trial. And this is so important. We're now seeing British courts move towards the fact that you don't even have to be in the court. Uh, they'll make a decision in your absence in quite a few cases, but otherwise you can come in with video link. And if we take uh, Melanie Shaw as one example, she's repeatedly been refused the right to appear in court in person. And when when she's had uh, when she she has been allowed to use Skype that Skype connection has been cut without any proper explanation to her as to why she was stopped from giving her testimony. So we ask, what's to stop an accused person being threatened or bullied off camera to influence their testimony to the court? That's easily feasible when we know the brutal uh, behaviour going on by court staff in HM Prison Peterborough or HM Prison Foston Hall, for example. And we know uh, that software already exists so that you can manipulate the di digital image of a person into what appears to be a real life um, video, which is, of course, fake. So these are very, very dangerous times. And uh, I'm just going to counter that by bringing in this. I think David Scott at, on the uh, coming Friday is going to be talking about what's been happening with the police and meetings of principally uh, older people up in Edinburgh. Um, or Scotland rather, but uh, this is the important thing that if we don't act, we become accomplices to what's going on. So if we've got police brutalising, if we've got the court system being shut down, we've got to act. And uh, why is it good to be a persistent campaigner? Uh, well, this was sent to us, a little clipping from the Scottish Express. Government act must act on child abuse. And we're very pleased to say that Scott Pattinson, who's, who's been a very long time, very dedicated campaigner on the subject of child abuse, is, is there in this article, effectively driving the article. So he says, we've reached unprecedented levels of child abuse. And I've found in my research that we're dealing with well-organized groups of people who embed themselves within structures to present them with the opportunity to act. And that is a very key, key uh, point he's making, that these people are embedded in the very systems which are claiming to be there to help children, social services, child services, and indeed the child protection charities. And Scott Patterson has now got out in the mainstream press in Scotland, of course, the risks of paedophiles embedded in these organisations. So we'll put that down to good news. Uh, sorry, so, Mike. Yes, we're here. Um, so. This is fantastic, Brian. Fake news, fake news, and of course the hysteria over fake news has is plumbing new depths today because this is Cambridge University uh, considering the possibility of providing a fake news vaccine. Now the word vaccine, of course, is in inverted commas because we're not talking about injecting anybody, at least not at the moment. Now that might come later, uh, but in the meantime, what they're talking about is uh, a study which is. Uh, intended to use sci applied psychological tools uh, to target what they're calling fact distortion. Uh, and they're suggesting that preemptively exposing people to a small dose of misinformation could cancel out what they're calling bogus claims. This is what the BBC is going to be working on with um, Facebook, I, I think, Mike, is, is this applied behavioural manipulation. And we've got the government's behavioural insights team, of course, doing the same. Right. And so uh, they particularly highlighted uh, stories surrounding the US election of Donald Trump and also stories around Syria as being ones of uh, particular concern. Uh, and uh, Cambridge University's uh, the lead author of this, Dr. Sander van der Leiden, uh, Linden, sorry, uh, said misinformation can be sticky, spreading and replicating like a virus. The idea is to provide a cognitive repertoire that helps build up resistance to misinformation so that next time people come across it, they're less susceptible. Uh, and uh, so this study is being published in the journal Global Challenges. Uh, and it was apparently conducted as a disguised experiment. 2,000 US residents uh, were given two claims about global warming. Uh, and uh, when they said that when these, uh, when these claims were presented consecutively, the influence uh, of uh, 
well-established facts uh, was cancelled out by the bogus claims. Um, but when the information was combined with misinformation in the form of a warning, then the fake news, as they call it, had less uh, resonance. Right. That's how they're describing it. Um, so, Mark, you've been uh, talking about the uh, weaponization of uh, the media for quite some time, but this potentially drives it to new levels. It does. First of all, the existing mainstream corporate deep state media that's allied with the military industrial banking complex is itself a way to try and inoculate us against the truth. And that's been going on, as you guys know, for decades. So clearly they're trying a more clinical approach now. They're, and, and they would only be doing this, in my view, if the if the old fashioned approach is losing its effect, losing its grip, which it is. Uh, when I talked to a lot of people right after the Trump rally, the, uh, the inauguration and his speech on Friday, January 20th, uh, pretty close to the podium, uh, whenever I brought up the media, everybody seemed to know CNN, MSNBC, and the normal networks in America are basically an enemy of the Constitution and the people in one way or another, to one degree or another. It's very universal. And these are just mainstream Republicans. I'm not standing there with a lot of you know, absolutely like-minded people like myself. So it's it's cutting across the body politic here that the existing media is not to be trusted in at least most respects, except for maybe sports scores. And maybe that's the next thing they're going to lie about. Oh, the Cowboys didn't actually win when they did or something. But yes, this is very interesting. So if I understand it right, they're testing what they think is a lie, but what we might think is the truth and they're testing it versus what they claim is their truth, which is actually a lie, and seeing which one gains primacy in the human mind. Uh, and and it's, it's just, it's Orwellian, and it's almost laughable, though, because uh, everything is the reverse of what they're actually saying. That, it, it, it's incredible. Well, this, this is 1984, is it not? Absolutely. Full blown. Yeah. So there we go. Okay, well, uh, this is an ideal time to introduce the BBC, of course, a 3.65 billion organisation which specialises in fake news. Uh, but uh, thank you to the person who sent this through to us, because the poor old BBC is a bit strapped for cash. They need to save 15 million. So they're going to get rid of their travel news website. Um, so um, there's plenty of money for setting up overseas media training. Um, BBC's pouring millions into that, but when it comes to providing public service for information on the roads, no, no, we don't want that. We're going to get rid of it. So this is the announcement. You can see it on the BBC's uh, Travel Online blog. But what was very interesting were comments from people. They're not happy. Marvellous. Just heard the BBC have a new global affairs programme starting tomorrow, but they can't keep a much needed website open in Britain for travel within this country. Yeah. So much as you say, Mark, people really waking up here, very disappointed to learn of this decision. I rely on this information, etc. And uh, if we just bring it up a bit more down at the bottom, uh, Ashani here says this decision is mean and insane. I work a long distance from home and I check your website for travel info several times a day, especially in winter. I could not have done without it on many occasions. Um, please rethink this. Our safety depends on it. So I, I was encouraged to see members of the public picking up. And some of those who've um, posted on that blog say it's no good being nice about this anymore. We've really got to get in these people's faces and demand that they deliver the service that they're supposed to. So people are waking up. There's no doubt about it. And what better target for them to uh, go for than the BBC? Right. Theresa May last week announced that she would be announcing the modern industrial strategy for Britain. And she has announced it today or she's announcing it as we speak. Uh, and uh, well, £4.7 billion pounds to fund uh, research and development into smart technologies, robotics, artificial intelligence, 5G mobile network technology. These are the type, types of things that they're going to do. Uh, and, uh, and a further £556 million pounds uh, and it's that one that I, I find particularly interesting, as we'll come on to in a second. So they've, as you can see there, they have uh, uh, released their 10 pillars, uh, which describes what they're going to be spending this money. Apparently, they're going to invest it in science, research and innovation, 
They're going to invest it in developing skills. Well, this, this one protect, uh, perhaps has some uh, benefit because they're going to be investing, they say, in science, technology, engineering, and maths education. I'll believe that when I see it, but, but uh, the intention would be good if, they, if, it would, if it was followed through on. Uh, they're going to spend some money upgrading infrastructure, apparently, We're going to, uh, but mostly on digital. So that's mostly uh, 5G infrastructure and uh, uh, broadband infrastructure. Not going to worry so much about energy, transport, water, and flood defense, as they are mentioned, but they're, they're not quite as important. Um, supporting businesses to start and grow, they're going to do that. They're going to improve procurement. And if everybody, anybody wants to know a bit more about procurement, there is a, a very interesting article on the UK Column website about, uh, about government procur procurement. Apologies. Uh, encouraging trade and inward investment policy. Trade, very important. Uh, delivering affordable energy and clean growth cultivating world leading sectors and driving growth across the whole country. And that, that's the interesting one uh, right there. So what did Teresa have to say? Uh, she said, uh, the modern industrial strategy will back Britain for the long term, creating the conditions where successful businesses can emerge and grow and backing them to invest in the long term future of our country. The modern industrial strategy will be underpinned by a new approach to government, not just stepping back, but stepping up to a new active role that backs business and ensures more people in all countries of the country share in the benefits of its success. This is the most important bit because this money is being uh, couched in the language of infrastructure development, business development, education, and these kinds of things. This, she says it here, will be underpinned by a new approach to government. So they're funding a new approach to government. They're not just going to step back, they're going to step up to a new active role so the government is going to take a new active role in our all our lives. Um, so there we go. And uh, the they're going to put lots of money into local enterprise partnerships. Now, if you haven't read uh, Evidence of the Defence Committee on EU Military Union yet by David Ellis, please do so, because he makes the point here. I'll just quote a little bit from this. It says, HM government may think that cancelling a squadron of harriers or scrapping a couple of ships saves money. My life experience is that it does not. And that is why I'm writing this submission. Rather, such cuts cost the nation in engineering expertise in the West Midlands uh, and nationally so that we can no longer produce timely goods. I've seen that the replacement model to fill the void after these defence cuts, that of the local enterprise partnership, merely serves to feed itself rather, itself rather than our economy. So David alleging that local enterprise partnerships take the money, feed themselves, don't do anything for the broader economy. So what is Theresa May doing? Well, this extra 500 million or so she's giving to 11 local enterprise partnerships. So Northeastern gets 50 million, Cumbria 12, uh, Tees Valley 22, uh, York uh, 23, Lancashire 70, Humber 28, uh, and so it goes on. Uh, millions of pounds going straight into the uh, local enterprise partnerships. That'll be money well spent, I've no doubt. Uh, but uh, Demos are getting in on the act as well. Uh, because uh, following uh, Theresa's announcement, uh, they are creating a head of program for the modern economy. Uh, and uh, Demos is establishing a new research program to respond to emerging economic policy challenges and opportunities in 2017 and beyond. Uh, the modern economy program will explore the major issues facing the UK government and our industries from the changing nature of work in the workforce to the challenging negotiation, uh, negotiation uh, of Britain from the EU. Uh, the programme will also produce innovative and forward-thinking new research and events on the next frontier of opportunity for inclusive economic growth. No one gets left behind. Uh, this is the shared society. Uh, the role offers genuine autonomy and the opportunity to shape a programme of research, events and policy positions that will support Demos organisational ethos and wider social mission Though Demos, sorry, through Demos established and cross-party links with the UK government, Parliament and the House of Lords, as well as the private and third sector, this provides a platform to drive considerable influence and social impact while strengthening personal and professional relationships. So they're putting somebody in place to be head of the modern economy. They're going to develop uh, policy plans, which are going to feed directly into Theresa May's new uh, platform. Uh, and... Uh, Theresa, Ye Theresa May's new form of government, which, uh, of course, we haven't actually been told what that is. Yeah, this is this is nothing to do with sort of governing the country and looking after the population of this country and ensuring the well-being of everybody in the country. This is a this is a completely separate corporatist agenda. 
which is what? The City of London. Yes. What can we say? Uh, Bring in the Chancellor. Bring or, in, the, well, ex-Chancellor. Well, ex-Chancellor. Ex-Chancellor, because he's getting his payoff. Now, of course, uh, he uh, got paid a significant amount of money for a speaking tour around the United States recently, £600,000 or something for speaking in a few places. Uh, but he has now uh, got himself a part-time job with BlackRock. Uh, now, BlackRock, world's largest hedge fund, $5.1 trillion of assets under management. I said trillion not billion, trillion dollars of assets under management. Uh, BlackRock, uh, as many people will know, but some may not, advises central banks. Uh, they advise finance ministries, uh, pension, other pension funds, uh, insurance companies, foundations, Soros perhaps, although Soros did nick one of their founders for his own hedge fund. Um, so huge hedge fund there uh, have employed George Osborne on a part-time basis. Uh, it's okay though. Because Osborne won't be lobbying on their behalf while he's an employee. No, he'd be independent. To totally independent. Uh, they aren't admitting how much he's getting paid, of course. No. So um, that's trillions, which is made by simply gambling off the back of banking interests. Yes. Um, and money created from nothing. What do you make of that, Mark? Uh, it, it's normal that when somebody is a, uh, a relatively poor politician, as politicians are, that, that once they leave the, jo the, the top jobs, they get the big payoff. Is that fair? And uh, took a very posh job representing banks and financial institutions. So here the revolving door is well in place between the banking committees and working in uh, either lobbying groups and or financial institutions or both lobbying for financial institutions. So one year the senator's doing his job, two years later the senator's appearing before the very committee that he used to head and, and getting huge speaking fees just like with Mr. Osborne, Mr. Perennial Bilderberger, at least for the most part. So, yeah, that's that's very intact here, and it's a very pernicious influence, of course. Yes, right. Apologies for the slight uh, lack of sound for the first two seconds of or a few seconds of what Mark said there. That I did press the button, but it uh, <laughs> had to press it again. Yeah. Uh, so, right, let's uh, let's move on then. Pensions. Um, obviously, this has been a subject that I've been talking about for quite some time. Guardian finally catching up. Uh, glad to see the mainstream media catching up. Uh, there's a danger of a generation who can't afford to retire, they say. Uh, it is impossible to consider retirement and our experience of it without also considering how we pay for it. Uh, and uh, the author goes on to, to uh, comment about other people's comments on this. She says, uh, one commenter uh, wrote about friends in the public sector in the late 50s, the 60s, retiring on pensions that were quite bewildering, is the quote. The comment went on, they'd probably be living on pensions longer than they were non-pensioners. I see my son at university and wonder how, how hard he and his generation are going to have to work to keep this society going. Many of my retiree friends think the same thing, but no one seems to know how we dig ourselves out of it. Um, so The Guardian finally catching up with the fact that, uh, that people are not going to be able to afford to retire. Uh, they quote David Willits, the former Conservative MP, who says, we could find ourselves facing a whole new generation of poor pensioners who, on average, are even worse off than the average poor pensioner today because far more of them were unable to get on the housing ladder. They'll be paying rent long past the point where their par mm -hmm. parents had paid off their mortgages. And he, goes, he went on to say, if we don't have system, uh, systematic responses now to the pension problems coming down the line, future generations will suffer. I've said this before, let's say it again, the black hole for the public sector and the state pension, the black hole is five trillion pounds. That's, uh, you know, two and a half, three times GDP. It's a huge uh, shortfall. Um, and they then go on to say that over a quarter of those aged 55 to 64 do not have uh, a private pension to make up the difference. And this rises to 42% across age, all age groups. Uh, and uh, and they're worried about the, the the reliance on savings. Well, just last week, Mark Carnage, um, head of the Bank of England, uh, in parallel with the announcement that uh, retail sales over December had dropped by 1.9% from the previous month, 
Uh, that was the uh, biggest monthly fall for more than four and a half years. Car uh, Mark Carney had been speaking to the London School of Economics and he was uh, saying that he was concerned that savings rates have fallen uh, to pre-crisis lows and the com consumer borrowing has accelerated notably. And, and it's interesting when you look at the, uh, uh, the retail figures, what they were talking about is, is uh, people uh, over the Christmas period buying things like food but not buying things like uh, cheap plastic white goods from China and whatnot. So, so they're concerned about retail sales falling. People are spending their savings, they're borrowing more to buy food. They're not spending that on things that they don't actually need. Yeah. So uh, this is setting up a huge, uh, a huge problem for, for the future. But it's all all right because there is this review of HM Treasury, which was originally uh, established by uh, uh, McDonald from the Labour Party, the uh, um, shadow uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, that was originally, this HM Treasury Review was originally set up in September 2015, and uh, it's headed up by uh, this man, Lord Kerslake, who's the former head of the civil service. Common purpose guru, we should add. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, of course, he uh, retired from the, as head of the civil service in 2015. Um, and uh, he was saying that the aim of the review uh, was to take evidence on whether the Treasury was doing the right kind of job. Uh, he's particularly concerned about uh, uh, austerity measures and all this kind of stuff, whether they're promoting and managing sustainable growth is what he wanted to do. And he wanted to, to check whether the Treasury was helping to develop a fairer and more equal society. So as I say, Lord Kerslake heading it up, Alan Buckle uh, on the panel with him, uh, he's ex KGM, uh, KPMG International. Stephen Hughes, uh, ex chief executive of uh, Birmingham City Council. There was never any corruption at Birmingham City Council, Brian. Um, well, there was a little bit. Yes. Uh, and there was a bit of trouble with elections. And, and that was Lynn Homer. But yeah, she was promoted up into the Treasury. That's right. But Stephen Hughes was, was, uh, was CEO of. Uh, of Birmingham City Council whenever there was scandal over money going to common purpose, but that's another issue. Uh, Carol Williams is a professor at the uh, University of Manchester's Alliance uh, and uh, at the Alliance Manchester Business School, sorry, and uh, and Simon Wren Lewis, uh, professor of economic policy at Blavatnik School of Government, uh, and the review was expected to report by July 2016. Um, Kurzweil said of the appointments that, that he was working with, they bring together a collective wealth of experience that will ensure we are equipped to cover the ground thoroughly. So that's good. But I'm pleased to say that, that this report is now finally going to launch uh, in uh, about three or four weeks time, 13th of February. The national launch is going to be at the University of Manchester. Uh, and uh, so we can look forward to that. It's uh, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. at Alliance Manchester Business School East, if anybody wants to uh, try to get along to that. Um, there's going to be an audience debate at it as well. I'm sure uh, if anybody asked uh, asked nicely, we could provide some questions for uh, Lord Kerslake. Uh, well, one of the key ones would be what happened to the missing millions in uh, Sheffield City Council. Uh, that caused a few problems with the establishment. While he was there. Indeed, yeah. yes. Yes, OK. Um, Mark, Davos was last week, of course, and uh, we have an article here from American Free Press written by your good self. Uh, dreading de-globalization in Davos. They really are uh, concerned about uh, the, the uh, sort of reaction to globalization that's taking place at the moment. Indeed. What's really particular to point out here, what's really interesting is just like with the uh, thin, baseless allegations of Russian hacking, not only of the Clinton Podesta emails, but the US election system itself, just like how that brought up the inadvertent admission from the establishment that if election machines can be hacked by Russia or anyone else, then that means the machines are hackable. That means electronic voting never was safe to begin with, even though all along they reassured, it, reassured us it was. So too is the situation in Davos, Switzerland that just wound up. The World Economic Forum meets there every year. They met January 17 through 20. They ended on the day of Trump's inauguration. And so in their uh, fuming and worrying and jittering over the rising populism of uh, Marie Le Pen in France, Brexit, 
such as it is, and especially the inauguration of Donald Trump. In in this situation, they they're now admitting, uh, in inadvertently uh, shooting themselves in the foot again. They're admitting that there is such a thing as an effort for world government, and there is such a thing as a new world order. And this includes the New York Times and the and the uh, One Worlders in that newspaper, as well as the Washington Post, but particularly the Times. Uh, they're so jittery about what they see as a populist uprising that they're letting it. They're letting secrets out that that hitherto uh, up to this point they told us didn't exist. We were told for years that there's no such thing as an effort for world government. We were told for years that there's no such thing literally as a new world order. And now they're admitting, as I mentioned in this American Free Press article, that, oh, oops, there is such a thing. And uh, that's what the World Economic Forum, the Bilderberg groups, uh, you know, the IMF, the World Bank. You, you know, note these words, you know, the, the United Nations. One might say that a world government might not be all bad. It's not a value judgment. It's it's simply the fact that, yes, there is a a movement to confederate or federate, not confederate, federate all the nations together in a world system. One might like it, one might not like it, but it exists. And now that has slipped out in their angst over Trump and the whole populist movement. So the the media and the overall establishment is is really in a state of of panic, and that's why these things are slipping out and they're shooting themselves in the foot repeatedly. <laughs> yes. Well, let let's talk a little bit about Trump then. Of course, uh, he was sworn in on Friday as president, and according to the New York Times uh, here, this caps his swift ascent. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Washington Post saying Trump takes off his vows and an end an end to American carnage. Um, they uh, they really still maintaining their hysteria over this situation? Oh, absolutely. I'm looking at that, that very uh, stuff in hard copy here. We have George F. Will, the uh, self-assigned expert on the Constitution, his editorial, the most dreadful address, referring to Trump's inaugural speech. And another, the, uh, the inauguration was a gothic nightmare. These are the headlines sprinkled throughout the post. And then the, the, the post's own editorial board, no better angels here. Mr. Trump strikes a pugnacious isolationist tone on a day usually devoted to democracy and peaceful leadership. <laughs> well, what I wrote in the American Free Press was just a straight report, no opinion whatsoever on what Trump had to say and what the people had to say about his speech. And we have... Um, Things in the New York Times, I, I don't want to misquote them, a subtitle, Uniquely Dark Vision of the U.S. in the New York Times. And the Post used that too, dark vision, dark concepts. Uh, a quick explanation goes as follows. First of all, what Trump talked about was democracy. He said this is not just a uh, transfer of power from one president to another. That's an exact quote. It's not just a transfer of power from one party to another, that's an exact quote, but it's a transfer of power from the government back to the people, and he also meant by that the states. A devolution, a decentralization of power, almost like deglobalization on a regional or national level. Decentralization of power, the same thing Davos is worried about on a global scale, the deglobalization, what they really mean is decentralization of power. They're worried about that. A devolution. So you have Trump being characterized as someone who's talking darkly about undemocratic things when, in fact, the people there found his speech to be, in their view, a ray of sunshine, a, as if the sun is coming out, as if he's including the, the people in the power structure once again, the very definition of democratic rule. And the, so the press isn't just, again, not just biased. They are knowingly and willfully misreporting. And people on the ground with me, including myself, but many others I spoke to there, don't see what the press reports. The, the press reports a different football game than we've seen on TV, to use a metaphor. It's almost as if you're going to see the Bears play the Cowboys. You see the game. You see the Cowboys win 10-8. to 8, and you read the paper and and the paper says the bears beat the cowboys 18 to 4 you know it's getting that bad to where they're so knowingly and willfully willfully lying that 
they don't even seem to care that the people who were there are going to see that this is a completely different thing than what's being reported. Uh, but but uh, sorry, Mark, you, you can't be right here because the BBC this morning uh, was was telling me as I was coming into the the studio this morning uh, that it's 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 the Trump camp, it's the Trump uh, administration, and anybody that supports the Trump Trump administration that's living in a different universe. So it must be us that's wrong. Well, like two trains moving in parallel, sometimes it is hard to tell which train is moving. But the thing is, and here's the other part of this, this dark vision thing, all Donald Trump said was that we have some crime in our streets and some mayhem, which was going on from these protesters at that very time. Protesters only a mile or two away burned an entire stretch limo and threw rocks through windows, anti-Trump protesters, vindicating a little bit of what Trump was saying. And what Donald meant was that our, our inner cities, particularly Chicago, run by an Obama ally, uh, the mayor Rahm Emanuel, uh, who used to fight for the Israeli Defense Forces, that our inner cities are, are having problems, some of them very significant. Donald Trump only spoke about that for maybe three to four minutes at the most out of a 16 to 18 minute speech. And the rest of it was largely very bright, very forward-looking, America first. This is what's rattling the windows in Davos, this talk about America first. This is what's making the Washington Post editors go to the bathroom five times per hour. Uh, you know, it, it's all, it, it's all uh, summing up to be a bright vision, not a dark vision. And, and Donald Trump was not offering a vision about inner city crime and families falling apart. It's not a vision. It's not a a dream or a forward-looking thing or just an idea. He was observing reality in the here and now. The word vision means to look ahead or to, to, to envision something, to look into the future or to think about an idea. And to the extent that he offered any vision, it was a bright one. It was forward-looking. The dark stuff was just reality in the here and now about inner city problems. So once again, not my opinion, just outright facts being completely mischaracterized and that's according to many people on the ground who were there at the inauguration and uh, so the media in in tandem with all these protests like we said earlier in the show is creating this cultural and informational and political chaos um, meant to destabilize and defame the the trump uh administration, the new administration, they're naming today, the 23rd of January, they're naming, uh, they're going to vote on whether Mike Pompeo, a Kansas uh, Republican, uh, a legislator, whether Pompeo is going to become the new CIA director. They've only named the new defense secretary, James Mattis, and a Mr. Kelly for head of D Department of Homeland Security. So today, they're looking at their third cabinet nominee that they're going to vote to confirm. They're expecting six hours of debate, at least on the Senate floor today, over naming, uh, you know, whether to confirm the new CIA director, Pompeo. A lot is going on. Uh, the Trump administration is trying to get its traction. People are saying, give it a chance. And so what we're seeing here, all in all, all told, is a media that is creating political discord, disharmony, and hurting the very democracy that they proclaim they're so valiantly protecting. It's just so hypocritical, and it's just such nonsense. And a lot of people are seeing it. I'm just speaking for a lot of people I spoke with. And what you heard on the BBC is just more of this echo chamber. They're all reading off the same script. Yeah. It's amazing. Yes. Well, Mark, thank you very much for that. Um, of course, another issue around Trump is that he's been saying that uh, NATO isn't working and he doesn't see why the Americans should pay for the brunt of the NATO operation when the Europeans in particular are not putting their money into the pot. And um, he's quite right in my opinion on that, but we'll take a little bit of a look behind the scenes as to what the EU military is up to. Before we go there, the other point he made is revitalization of American industry. And I have to say maybe that's needed because uh, this little issue has hit the headlines over the last few days. Uh, a Trident missile uh, malfunction during one of the trials off an American range. Uh, so the submarine launched the missile and it didn't quite go where it was supposed to go. Where did it go? We don't know. Mm -hmm. So that's the slogan. So I'm just going to gently say a few problems there with Trident missile. Why would the BBC be keen on this? Because, of course, it allows them to get in yet another attack about the nuclear deterrent. 
But let's move on to the subject of aircraft carriers because uh, the mail here has got the shocking story that the launch of uh, the Navy's big new aircraft carrier, Queen Elizabeth, could be delayed after the three billion vessel is hit by a number of technical problems. Well, there's already a problem that there's no aircraft for the aircraft carrier, but there are a few technical problems. Uh, so this is the cyber ship. This is how you can construct a, an aircraft carrier by using IT. We're very good on this, uh, Mark. We can create a whole fleet in a matter of hours by just using IT. Uh, this is the reality. So the ship's um, clearly not ready and um, unlikely to be ready for some time. Part of the problem is that they have to dredge out the harbour in order to allow the ship to use Portsmouth Harbour. Uh, I think these are some incredible things coming to light and some heads should roll. But let's have a look at what they're saying. The carrier, along with sister carrier HM, HMS Prince of Wales, is part of a £6.2 billion project to allow the UK to help other nations police the world. Uh, this is not about defence of UK. This is about policing the world. We can't run our country, but we're going to police the world. Each carrier can carry up to 36 Lightning II aircraft, but we'll only have one squadron of F-35s to fly off the Queen Elizabeth, which will be 16 jets when it enters service in 2020, Maybe. if it's not delayed. Uh, this has led to claims that when the second carrier comes into service 18 months later, it will be a gigantic white elephant with no UK aircraft to fly from it. Yes. Well, that's a bit sad, isn't it? So uh, let's go on. Um, we now get a clue because here it is. Uh, the last sentence um, actually in this uh, Daily Mail article said, as a result, the US are expected to make use of the carrier with their aircraft, as may other countries such as Italy, who eventually buy the jets. So this is the truth. This is Britain's aircraft carriers are, in fact, European Union carriers to be, uh, sorry, that should say with the EU, to be jointly operated with the EU. So we're going to run a carrier library, basically, and just lend it out to whoever wants it? We've, we've, well, it was built with the French. We had to get the French involved because we've never built aircraft carriers, apparently. Well, a few since 1914. Um, we now need the French to train our flight deck crews because the delay has been so colossal, we've lost all our expertise. So now we've got to say, please, French, please, French Navy people, come on, uh, allow us to come on board your carrier so that we can learn how to operate carriers. And uh, here's the new captain, Commodore Jerry Kidd. He says this, HMS Queen Elizabeth is a transformation. There's the key word, a transformation for the Royal Navy and for the entire British Armed Forces and indeed the country. She's a strategic asset that's going to be playing on the world stage for the next 50 years. Well, without any aircraft, she's certainly going to be playing. And then he goes on. So while she's been in build for the last couple of years, now we've got to understand how we're going to use an operator. So we've got £6.3 billion worth of carrier program. But Mike, we apparently, we just don't know um, what we're going to do with these ships. No. So uh, we build the ships and then we worry about what we're going to do with them afterwards. Yes. If fun. we can get them out the harbour because the harbour is not deep enough. Right. Uh, but don't worry about Royal Navy procurement. There is no crisis. There's no crisis in the NHS. Well, let's bring in the UK column. This actually was an unpublished article uh, back in May 2008. Royal Navy builds for an air threat. This is the carriers and misses the enemy within. Uh, I think we'll have to finish this article off. We were spot on talking about the fact that these carriers were nothing to do with the Royal Navy. These were actually to do uh, with the European Union. And part of the article said, we're told that plans for a European crew for these new carriers has been dropped. Has it? The usual plan of attack by the EU bureaucracy is to mention a subject uh, pretend to drop it and then implement it by the back door. As with the European armies formed bit by bit, we sure the same plan exists for both the Royal Air Force and Royal Navy. Right, now that's a raw article. There's some grammatical mistakes and whatever in it. But this is the one we did publish. And what we were actually saying here is the fact that um, 
the plans were there put forward by Sarkozy. This was the backdoor deals done with David Cameron, that they were forming a European uh, Navy. And our joke in the cartoon here is that the, there's two towers on the carrier. The first one is manned by the British, who are saying, where are the French? And the French are in the second tower saying, we're right behind you. Um, Mark, this is, it, it is like our country has gone mad over the last 10 years. We are seeing the most unbelievable childish uh, statements uh, concerning national health, the roads. Uh, we're now into the military and uh, we've got an aircraft carrier, but it's got no aircraft and um, we, we've got minimal uh, we've got minimal escorts to go with it. So really, Trump's worries about what's going on in Europe seem to be correct. Well, the way I see it, my opinion is that this is all from this misappropriation, this dis and misalignment, if you will. I'm coining words here in a way. The notion that a military exists to police the world creates these distortions. If people operated on a more nationalistic policy, you would dredge your harbors, you would build aircraft carriers in accordance with the planes that you plan on putting on, on them. Everything would line up. You wouldn't have a chessboard without chess pieces. You wouldn't have a checkerboard without checker pieces. You, you would build everything according to a national schematic and everything would, would be in, in order. But when you want to police the world and pimp out your ships to whatever crew wants to use them, and you're not even sure what aircraft you're going to use and you're not even sure what your mission is because after all policing the world is a complicated unwieldy thing that then this this shows how internationalism is just a, a bowl of porridge that that no one should eat it 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 creates all these distortions uh, a misappropriation of money uh, vague plans that nobody even knows how to carry out and it just shows that donald trump is at least in his words, and we're looking at his actions, I'm not a Trump groupie here, I'm being objective, but it just shows that what Trump is saying, basically, that we need a more nationalistic military policy, at least a little more, like he said in his inauguration speech, and we need, we need a more sovereignty restoring, basic industrial restoration, and these sorts of things. If every country would follow that, it doesn't mean that international trade is gone or non-existent, but if every country would follow that schematic, you wouldn't have all these distortions and misappropriations and nations defending their own basic interests first with goodwill toward others, like Trump said in his speech, he implied goodwill with Russia. If this was the credo, then a lot of this would disappear, but they're just so bent on this international system, the rules-based world order, as the Washington Post is talking about, the Trump is Trump is supposedly threatening, excuse me. Uh, they've just got to admit that their their vision, their vision is the dark vision, not Trump's. Their vision is the unworkable vision, not Trump's. And this is the cause of all this. They've just got to face the facts that their system is not the way to go. They've had their day in the sun since the end of World War II. They've had time to prove this. They're losing the argument. And that's it. Yeah. Mark, you couldn't have put that better. Thank you very much for summing up in that way. A great conclusion to our news today. But I'm just going to whisper um, in secret what the British aircraft carriers are really for, because that was also stated under one of the photographs in the uh, Daily Mail article. Those aircraft carriers are for fighting ISIS. So just think about that too carriers, 6.3 billion pounds. The captain not sure of what they're for, but the Daily Mail has told uh, readers that they're for fighting ISIS. Good. So on that note, we can be, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Forget ISIS. Yes, that the eternal threat, the existential threat to all that is good. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that's it for today. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for joining us. Thank you to our viewers and listeners. Can, can I just make an announcement before we of course. go? Right. Uh, so speaking to Ian Crane this morning, and uh, the executive decision has now been made that uh, uh, fracking nightmare and the Crane report when it happens, but fracking nightmare, at least initially, uh, will now move to Thursday nights. So Thursday nights for fracking nightmare from now on. 
uh, Monday nights are in the past. Right. Well, there we are. That's the beauty of UK column. Instant decision made <laughs> made live on air, not like the BBC, which would have required several board meetings. Thank you for joining us. If you like what we do, please subscribe. We need your financial help and support to keep doing what we do. Thank you. Bye-bye.